Please read along quietly as I read aloud Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35 and going to verse 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is God's holy and inspired word. By his grace and mercy, as it's now preached for you, pay careful attention to all that he says. Please be seated. The disciples are frantic. They're faced with a situation that appears to be a situation of certain death, alone, with no one coming to their rescue and no one coming to their aid. And in their humanity, they just can't understand why they can look at Jesus, the one who has been there with and for them all along, and he seems unconcerned so much so that he is in the stern of the ship, fast asleep. But Jesus is about to do for the disciples what I also pray that he would do for us this morning. He is about to reveal more of himself to his disciples in such a way that he will deepen their faith. He will take the very crisis that they face and use it as an instrument to sanctify them and grow them deeper in grace. You see, he's going to help them. He's going to enable them to see life in the proper perspective. And he's also going to enable them to see the providence of God and embrace it. So this morning, as we're looking together, I want us first to take a few minutes and let's look just at that first aspect, how faith enables us to see life in proper perspective. You see, right from the start, Mark helps us kind of gain something of a setting in our passage this morning. He also lets us know that he's writing as an eyewitness, even though he personally was not there when this took place. You see, Mark was added into, the, into the, the, the leadership of the early church later on, but here Mark writes from first-person perspective. How? He got the details and the information that he needed straight from Peter, who was there. And Peter gave Mark certain details that both Matthew and Luke chose to ignore as they wrote of this same event. Details like on that day, all the other boats with him, and just as he was. Each one of these phrases shows us that this is an eyewitness account, but it also gives us something more of the context or the setting that we need for our passage today. So what was that day? On that day, that day had been a very long day. Jesus had already been teaching the multitudes. A great throng had come around him. They were pressing in on all sides. They were pressing in so much, in fact, that Jesus, getting away from the crowd slightly, had to get into a boat and put out a little way from shore in a boat so that he could teach uninterrupted by those clamoring for another miracle to be touched, to be healed, and also to provide an, an atmosphere in which he could be clearly heard. So Jesus on that day, teaching the multitudes, also was that day that he began teaching them in parables. The parable of the sower, the parable of the mustard seed. Even on this day, Jesus took his own disciples aside and he made sure that they understood the parables by specifically helping them apply it to their lives and even helping them understand why he was teaching in parables at all. He explained that he was teaching in parables so that those who had ears to hear could hear. But those who did not have their spiritual ears open or their eyes open to see, to hear, to understand would be left in their darkness. 
That's an amazing and astounding statement about why Jesus spoke in parables, but that is what he is doing on this day. Jesus is teaching multitudes, he's teaching in parables, he's teaching his disciples, he's growing them in faith. And at the end of this day, we are told by Mark, as evening came on, Jesus is ready to do more ministry still. He said to his disciples, let us get into the boat and let's go to the other side. Well, on the side he was on, the west side of the Sea of Galilee, he was in the Jewish region where he'd been doing ministry among the Jews. But now Jesus lets the disciples know he's ready to go to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, to the area of the Gadarenes. He's going to the Gentile side where he would also continue to do ministry. So at the end of this long day of teaching, of ministry, with Jesus tired, exhausted. Getting into the boat, Mark tells us, just as he was. We can identify with that, can't we? We've each sort of faced those long, hard days where it just seems like the day is never quite going to come to an end, and yet when it comes to an end, someone else needs us. Someone else is asking more from us. Maybe it's when you get home from work and you realize even your day at work, as hard as it was, was nothing compared to what the family had been going through, and now you needed to show up and be there on behalf of your family and give and give again. Well, Jesus is in that situation on that day, ready to do more ministry, but fatigued, physically, humanly speaking, tired. He is worn out. So they get in the boats, but you know, getting in the boat wasn't enough. The crowd still pressed in. We're told by Mark that others got into other boats and they too are still going with the disciples across the sea. Wherever Jesus was going, they wanted to be in the action. Wherever Jesus was going to be, even if it was to the Gadarenes, to the, to the region of Gentiles, they were willing to go just to see what else he might do or what else he might say. And Jesus, in need of rest, gets in a boat, but Mark shifts our attention away from the group of boats to one singular boat with 13 men. He zooms in and we see somewhere now on their way across the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee actually is a little bit more like a lake. I've seen lakes. When we lived in Colorado, they, 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 there was things that they called lakes that looked more like ponds. Okay, this Sea of Galilee doesn't look too much like a sea as much as it does like a lake. It's only 13 miles long, seven and a half miles wide. It sits some 680 feet below sea level, below the level of the Mediterranean Sea. On either side, it's kind of a rocky, craggy cliffs, especially on the east side where Jesus was headed. There we see even Mount Hermon that rises to 9,200 feet of altitude. This is the setting. It's kind of a perfect picture of a sea set down in a bowl. And somewhere while they're en route from the west to the east side, suddenly a ferocious, furious storm comes upon them. Actually, in the Greek, the word here for the the strength of this storm, we might as well think of it as a hurricane. Blows in out of nowhere, and the disciples suddenly are facing life or death. They're in a a tremendous situation in which they are panicking. The waves are already crashing over the edge of the boats. The ship is ready to sink, and these are not, these are not green men that, uh, well, that didn't sound right. That sounds like Martians. Um, <laughs> these were not men who didn't understand the context of the sea. These, many of them were fishermen. They were familiar even with this sea, and yet they are terrified for their very lives. And in their panic, what do they do? They see Jesus peacefully asleep. In their panic, they begin to try to rouse him with repeated cries. Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Do we mean so little to you that you can just let us die while you stay sound asleep? You see, fear overwhelmed them. And dismay overshadowed the view of their master's love for them. Now, I think right here may be a good time for us just to step back for a moment and do more than just follow the narrative as Mark presents it. You see, something in me looks at this question, Master, do you not care that we're perishing? And I I would like to take the disciples to task. I mean, 
if the boat sank with all 12 of them in it and Jesus in the, is in the boat sound asleep, isn't it sort of illogical to think that he wouldn't perish as well? But like I said, I would like to take them for task for the lack of logic or for the lack of faith, but I have to admit that so many times when I come up against a hard situation that throws me into fear as I look at the circumstances around me, I have to admit I'm all too human myself. See, whenever fear stands in the place of faith, we can quickly lose perspective. Circumstances surround us, and they become the only reality that we see while what we know to be true about Jesus somehow gets pushed out to the edges, gets minimized, or even crowded out. And when this happens, we need someone to open our eyes so that we can regain an eternal perspective that we need. It's exactly what Jesus does in the passage this morning. Look at verse 39. And he awoke. And he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. You see, Jesus took action so that the disciples' faith could be restored. In response to the frightened rebuke that he had just received from his own disciples, he woke fully and he rebuked not the disciples, but the wind and the sea giving this authoritative command, peace, be still. At once, the wind tuckered out. Literally, that's what the Greek says. We might, we might even translate it or amplify it by saying, the wind ran out of gas. It stopped. And the sea grew calm. Not even a single billow continued to roll. It was smooth as glass. And I think here's where Mark begins to help us see a principle that's important for us. In response, rather, whenever we look at only our circumstances apart from faith, we will lose perspective and we'll be bound by fear. But when we look at circumstances through the lens of faith in the gracious providence of God, we are free to live life in proper perspective, growing deeper in our faith still. Now we can look at the second aspect Mark needs us to see, how faith enables us to embrace the providence of God. Turning to the disciples, Jesus calls them to greater faith when he says, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? I like how Matthew says it, you little faith ones. That's what Jesus says in answer to their cry. He loved them too much to leave them where they were. What he's doing here is he's actually calling them out, calling them into a deeper relationship with himself. He's saying, have you watched me so long, seen the miracles, heard the teaching, and still you're not quite there? Is it possible that somehow you're missing it? And while Jesus' words still were echoing in their minds, the disciples now are left only with time to reflect on not only the miracle, but now the challenge that Jesus has just given them. Lovingly, lovingly he has called them to more. And they get, we get their response as we look at verse 41. They were filled with great fear and said one to another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, here's where a little bit of knowledge of the original language goes a long way to help us, because in verse 40, where the disciples are fearful, the word in Greek there actually points to timidity or cowardly acts. That's being afraid of the circumstances around you. But in verse 41, the great fear which is overwhelming them is something that's entirely different. In fact, it is the fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord, yes, is reverential awe as to who and what he is and what he has done. But it's more than that. These men had just seen the raw power of God on full display. They had seen something that they knew was no ordinary action, and they are overwhelmed, not just with reverential awe, but they are terrified at the power and the majesty of this man who was God in flesh. And that can be our only response ourselves. It should be our only response. Jesus is calling us through the crises 
and through the blessings that we might get to this place where we too are not fearing the circumstance around us. Rather, we are in absolute terror of the magnanimity of who he is. You know, one of the the concerns I have as a pastor, when we look at our covenantal families as they come to church, one of the biggest blessings our children have is that they are part of this covenant body of Christ. And yet one of the biggest threats that they face is they are part of this covenant body of Christ. I grew up in the church. I heard God's word proclaimed. But it wasn't until I was 23 and had already graduated from a Bible school that I actually came to the face-to-face with my need for a personal redeemer, a relationship with Jesus Christ rather than head knowledge. Jesus does the same thing here with these disciples. He's saying, don't take for granted. Don't try to put who I am in that little finite box of yours with this preconceived notions that help you kind of sort me out. I'm much greater than that. And today, Jesus is calling us to do the same. What should our response be in the face of 2020? What should our response be as we look back not only at 2020, but at the entirety of our lives with all the blessings God has given, as well as all the challenges that we have faced? What is the takeaway that is here for us this morning? We should look back and understand that everything that we have experienced in this life is sent by the gracious hand of God with one purpose, and that's to increase our faith in him. Everything. The good, those things that we readily welcome as way to go, well, God, I can't believe you did this, and the challenges, those things which candidly, honestly, we wouldn't have chosen for ourselves, yet they are divinely put in our lives as part of the perfect plan of God. Bruce said it, we shouldn't be too quick to want to put the heart of 2020 in that rearview mirror. Because we know that for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, God works all things together for good. Not things that are just good work together for good, but all things, even the bad things, God works them together for good because he is calling us through them deeper into relationship with himself. You see, God's working in your life, and he's working in mine. Sometimes it's easier to see what he's doing because he makes his path plain, but other times he is working behind the scenes and we're not even aware that he's working at all, but still he is working. God was just as sovereignly at work when he called the storm into existence while Jesus was humanly asleep as when he calmed the storm in order to grow the faith of the disciples who were with him in the boat. Always, God is at work. And always he is doing exactly what we need. And always he is providing for us exactly what he provided for his own son. He says to us in Romans 8, not verse 28, but verse 32, how will he not also graciously give us all things as he also gave his son? Why? So that we can become more than conquerors through him who loves us so. As you examine your heart this morning in preparation for coming to the Lord's Supper, I want us to realize that Mark ends this chapter focusing entirely on Jesus with a question that he doesn't even answer. Who is this man? Jesus. How's your faith this morning in this man? Have you at this point come to a place where you understand that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, he died in order to pay for your sins in full so that you might have eternal life in him? His offer remains for you this morning still. Are you able to look back on the events of this year of your life and and actually believe that God is for you? And he's working for your good, he's working for your glory, whether you understand what he's doing right now or not. I like what the English Presbyterian Puritan John Flavel said about this. The providence of God is like the Hebrew language. You can only read it backwards. 
Or perhaps you identify easier with the Danish philosopher and theologian Soren Kierkegaard, who put it this way, we live life forwards, but we only understand it looking back. See, by faith this morning, I would like to encourage us, look back. Look back at every blessing. Look back at every trial you have faced. But look back through the lens of faith in the gracious providence of God. See what he is doing and trust him. He is working to increase your faith so that you will live boldly for him. Father, we ask for your help because this is counterintuitive. It's not natural. It is supernatural. We need you, Lord, to show us, to to open our eyes that we might see, to open our ears that we might hear, that we might understand exactly what you, Lord, are doing in and through the blessings and the trials, the tribulations you send our way. Lord, give us faith that we might believe that all things do work together for good, for our ultimate eternal good and for your glory. And Lord, as you do that, we will give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.